Thank you all. Thanks so much. Welcome to the freest state in the United States. God bless you guys. We're happy that, that you're here. I want to thank Senator Simpson for the introduction. He hit a lot of the high points. I mean, we are uh, in a situation where, of course, uh, we protected people's right to work and businesses to operate and kids to go to school, and that's had a huge impact on, on where we are and the quality of life and our economy. Uh, when you look at the fact that, yes, we do have the lowest per capita tax burden in the nation, that's very attractive to a lot of people, uh, but we're able to utilize that in ways that are producing better services and better results for the citizens. I have people move, as you might imagine, there's people that move into Florida from other states and they will compare. So Wilton mentioned the difference between New York. They, have, they don't even have the same population. They have three million fewer people than Florida now. Their budget's over twice the size, but anyone that moves from there to here will say, your infrastructure is so much better, your roads are nicer, your services are better, I can get my driver's license in two minutes, it's unbelievable. Uh, and our K through 12 system is now ranked number three for education achievement in the United States. We're the number one state for school choice, uh, but we also have uh, uh, now strong public education. That wasn't necessarily true when I was growing up in Florida. I mean, certainly uh, we would not have been on New York's level or California. Now they've really gone in the other direction and we're going in a good direction. And so it just shows you uh, that good, sound, conservative policies really do make a difference. And what we're seeing, What we're seeing, particularly since COVID, because you know, Florida's always had lower taxes than a lot of these other states, and, and that has been a, an attraction for sure. But what we've seen over the last uh, two years is much more than just lower taxes. Uh, you have people fleeing uh, lockdowns, arbitrary restrictions and mandates. In fact, some of your governors would lock down their people and then the governors would come to Florida and live normally uh, for this. Didn't necessarily want that publicized, but that was absolutely happening. There were locked down mayors in some of these big cities that would lock down their population and then you'd see them in Florida uh, enjoying freedom. And so that's what you, but that I think caused a lot of people to say, you know what? I can't even operate a business or I can't get my kids in school. That's the last straw and that caused more and more people to come. Another thing that, that has caused is in 2020 summer, uh, when you started to see riots uh, in different parts of the country in Florida, I called out the National Guard immediately. We were not gonna let it happen here. And we never indulged any of this nonsense about attacking law enforcement. We said from the very beginning, we back the people that wear the uniform. And what happens is, as you've seen in some of these places, when they defund or take the funding away, you've seen crime absolutely skyrocket. Now even places like Seattle are scurrying to try to figure out how can we now fund police because they knew how catastrophic that was. So we never did that at one, and I think some people are looking, it's like you can have, heck, people can put up sometimes with higher taxes, or something, but if you don't have safety, public safety, the people just aren't tolerating it. So I think that absolutely fuels um, a lot of what we've seen uh, in terms of the state of Florida. And the result has been, it's different than past migrations in Florida. When I got elected governor, we had 280,000 more registered Democrats than Republicans in the state of Florida. Today, and it'll probably be uh, fully publicized uh, very soon, today for the first time in the history of Florida, we've now overtaken Democrats. There are more registered Republicans in Florida than Democrats. And it's, it's good for us, but I mean, honestly, I look like we would have probably won the New Jersey governor's race, but all the Republicans moved to Florida from New Jersey because they, they get so frustrated. I mean, so, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. But, but that, so I think what you've seen in terms of some of this migration to our state, much more than just taxes. I think it's, I think it's fleeing the, the, the restrictions. I think it's fleeing the lawlessness and the crime um, and, and many other things. And so, you know, we're proud of that. I mean, quite frankly, we, uh, uh, it's a free country. People can move. We're not like begging people to move, but I do think that you're seeing people move to states that value freedom. And, and that's just the reality. And it's unfortunate because 
You know, I look back, if you like, watch like Kennedy debate Nixon, you know, Republican, Democrat. I mean, honestly, they had differences. But like, you wouldn't say that one person like totally rejected the founding of the country and the Constitution and normal stuff. Like they were just kind of different shades. But now you're in a situation, once these areas go deep blue, they get destroyed. How many places are deep blue that are well governed in this country? Can you name me some? Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Chicago, New York City. I mean, tell me where you would find this success story of woke progressivism imposed on a people. I don't see it. And so that's just unfortunate that this stuff really, really matters uh, because if you let it go into the wrong hands, uh, it's very difficult to dig out uh, of some of the things that we've seen throughout, throughout the country. So I think there's a few things that, that we can do at the state level as Republicans uh, to see what's going on, uh, protect our states, and protect against the federal government. The first is, is I think we all have to look back at what's happened over the last year and a half with lockdowns, school closures, and granted, some states faced it very significantly because you had governors who were very lockdown happy. Other states like Florida, you know, we were respectful of people. Uh, and, and so that's good. But regardless of how your experience was, we have to look back and say, you should not allow a governor to stop society unilaterally. Have a governor locking kids out of school for a year, having governor destroy thousands and thousands of businesses, denying people the right to work, all these different things uh, are really not consistent with the constitutional system. And so I think every state uh, needs to provide uh, protections against abuse of these emergency powers, particularly when you're talking about uh, authoritarianism, medical authoritarianism. We had states in this country where they closed churches and then they had liquor stores and strip clubs open at the same time in casinos. And so this is a, a cherished constitutional right and they just said no. You actually had to have churches go in and sue just to be able to have be open and be able to let people worship. Uh, if we were here two years ago and I told you that that could happen, nobody would have believed me. People would have said, no way, that could never happen in the United States. So we have witnessed, uh, I think, more significant erosion of our freedoms due to COVID uh, than anything in my lifetime. And so I think we just have to resolve, never again are we going to let this happen. This whole idea... This whole idea that you can just stop society and then all of a sudden things are going to pound, that is not, not right. It's not, I don't think, constitutional, but clearly it didn't work. And so we have to resolve freedom over Fauciism, and that's what all of us should be committed to do. You know, Fauci... Rand Paul's like the only one that will hold this guy accountable. He, he funded the Wuhan lab, okay? He funded it. He, he lied about it. He funded gain-of-function research. These are, these are like mad scientists trying to create super viruses, and then this, this gets out of the thing, and look what we end up happening. They're doing these really cruel experiments on puppies that, that with tax dollars. I mean, really sick stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, what, how much damage has this guy done? He's been the most destructive bureaucrat in the history of our country. I tell people that um, a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose yours. A recovery is when Dr. Fauci loses his job. So protect your folks against authoritarianism under the guise of COVID. And I think right now that means protecting uh, the jobs of your citizens and don't let them get fired due to COVID mandates. And that's true whether it's a government mandate or a corporate mandate, because quite frankly, our country with how these big corporations have been behaving, they act as an arm of the government and the ruling class, unfortunately. And so they're trying to impose a lot of mandates. So these are companies that put these people to work for the last year and a half. Nurses on the front lines, a year and a half, taking care of COVID patients. And now all of a sudden, they're gonna get tossed aside over this jab, when many of them have actually had COVID and recovered from it, 
and many of them have, have reasons for, uh, for, for what decisions they make. So I think that that's just fundamentally wrong. And so you've got to ask yourself, you know, how, when you get elected to office, you know, how do you use your power? And my view is, is, you know, if people are being treated poorly like that, you know, I want to use my power to be able to, to help prevent that. And so that's what we're going to be doing is a special session. We're going to do a special session in Florida. We're going to pr pr protect uh, people's jobs. First of all, our economy can't handle losing even 1% of people in these key areas. It will absolutely collapse trucking and all this other stuff. It'll be a total, total disaster. Uh, we we want to do it. And, uh, and I think some of the things that bothers me about it is just like, when did, like, your employer become your medical custodian? This OSHA rule, they actually have to keep your records uh, in your business. And I'm just thinking to myself, is that really the road that we want to go down? So I think this is a personal decision. I think it's a private decision. Um, and I think the more we can say that our society is not going to bring different power to bear on people, the better we are. So I would encourage everybody, uh, make sure you're meeting. If you're already in session, if not, get in there. Um, and provide protections for people. Because I'll tell you, this is something that folks remember. Uh, they're going to remember whether you stood up for them or whether you just saw them get pink slips and just said, hey, nothing I can do. So, so do that and protect. Now, that's within your own, your own jurisdiction, making sure that people's rights aren't violated from either governors or big corporations or whatever. But I also think we have to take a stand against the federal government and what they're trying to get away with. And we have to vindicate our rights as states. And so you look at this OSHA rule that they're doing, and I've read some of it. I haven't read all of it, but I mean, it really isn't just about vaccine. I mean, they are taking, uh, using that as a pretext to get the federal government involved in really micromanaging a lot of different parts of businesses. There's even one thing where they're talking about, well, you can apply for some financial assistance to be able to comply with this, but you, you have to not be able to raise your prices. And they're like going through all this stuff, and I'm just thinking to myself, you know, you have some bureaucrat sitting up there in D.C. thinking that somehow they know how business runs and all this stuff, and it's really, really horrifying. So I look at that OSHA rule. They reject immunity conferred through prior infection, which means it's clearly not science that they're doing if they reject that in spite of all the studies. Um, they acknowledge that vaccinated people get and transmit the Delta variant at relatively high rates, which again, if that's the case, then this, what is this mandate seeking to accomplish? Uh, so they go through all this stuff and they put all this, all this garbage in there. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, it's not good policy. Um, it's not it's not constitutional, but what even bug me more than that is like who the hell thinks they can get away with this in this country? The fact that someone thinks they can get away with this uh, shows we've got a lot of problems. And so we need to fight back. Uh, we need to have a strong response. Yes, we're filing lawsuits. Many of your states may be doing that. I think they'll probably be successful. But we as states, we need to make sure that from a political perspective, the executive and the legislative branch, uh, that we view this as a total non-starter on day one. And we need to make sure we're protecting businesses uh, from having the heavy hand of the federal government uh, come down on them. And you think about it, it's government has limited, federal government has limited and enumerated powers. You know, the states, when they talk about vaccine mandates and they say, oh, courts have upheld it, understand what they've upheld is states and local doing different different things and, and in florida you know we we have the typical ones we have exemptions and nobody it's fine no one's complaining about it uh but to have the federal government which doesn't have a police power that's them taking away the power from states usurping it for themselves and then imposing this which will only be the beginning if you looked at that rule they are now soliciting should we apply it to every business, regardless of how many employees? Should we do the booster shot? Should we make everyone wear masks? Just think about it. They could conceivably require every employee in the United States to wear a mask at work. Like, what the hell is their, uh, uh, their ability to do that? And so this is really, as, as aggressive as it is, this is just the opening salvo from them. So if we don't fight back against it, you're going to absolutely get more and more and more. And I think it's... Um, uh, I think it's really important that it not just be a legal response, that it also be a political response. So that's what we're going to be doing in the state of Florida. Uh, we're going to be working with folks in the private sector to make sure that this is something that just simply will not stand. And I think I look up and say, okay, 
you have the bureaucracy, you, know, you have Biden, and, and look, this is very political what Biden's doing because he's trying to change the subject because quite frankly, he's failing on almost every front. And I, I, I don't really say that, I mean, as a Republican, that's gonna end up helping us, but I really would rather our country do well. Uh, but if you look at what's happening at the southern border, uh, the biggest disaster we've ever had at the border in my lifetime, uh, if you look at what happened in Afghanistan, the humiliation that we suffered uh, with his, um, I mean, just half-cocked plan to, to, to withdraw, leaving all those Americans behind, people remember that. You know, we, we all deal with politics all the time. We have constituents that deal with politics all the time. But you've got a lot of folks that just live their lives. They don't really follow it day to day. That is something that sticks in people's craw regardless of how much they're, they're following the news. Uh, so he does that. You look at what's happening with gas prices. They're debating whether they're going to close more pipelines when you've had huge increase in fuel prices, which is going to be uh, devastating to a lot of folks, particularly uh, working class people. And then inflation, they said, was just a blip, that it wasn't something that's going to last. And yet we see that is really, really strong. And so if you have people's wages go up 3 percent, but inflation's up 6 percent, that means people are losing ground. If you look at what's happening with the supply chain, uh, you're going to have uh, continued you to see stores that don't have shelves stocked. I mean, my wife and I, we bought all our Christmas presents already because we weren't sure we we're going to be able to get it. I usually wait the day before, two days before. I wasn't going to do that this year. So you see all these problems. We're actually rerouting ships that are waiting uh, that are now coming to Florida to be able to unload their goods um, because they're sitting off the coast and it's just ridiculous. So, so he's failing on all those fronts. And remember, what he ran on I mean, his, his candidacy is fun, was fundamentally a fraud on the public. I mean, he basically ran on two things. One, he demagogued COVID against Trump. And he said, Trump is to blame for COVID. If you, if you elect him, he would shut down the virus. That's what he said. He would shut down the virus. If you want to compare the uh, results since he's been president to Trump, who do you think has had more people die of COVID? It's Biden. And it's not slowing down. He is not shut down the virus. And that was a fundamental promise he made. He, he lied, he demagogued it, he lied about it. And the result is now, I think he's scurrying uh, to try to save face uh, because what he said would happen didn't happen. And he doesn't really have a plan. So this is kind of a way to piece that together. The other thing that's been fraudulent about him is he ran basically saying he was going to be a unifying president. Uh, he criticized Trump, said Trump's division, all this stuff. I'm going to unite the country. I'm going to do this. And yet, He's pursuing more divisive policies than any president in my lifetime, and that includes Obama. I think he's more divisive on policy uh, than Obama was. And so he's, uh, he's failing, and I think this is a way to try to uh, throw a lifeline to a failing presidency. I think it's going to backfire. I think actually it's not, not going to work, but I think the way they think, I mean, you know, they think that dealing with like the Virginia stuff, where these parents are so concerned about the nonsense that's being taught in their schools. And what does the, the, the Biden and the corporate press say? There's no such thing as critical race theory in school. Like they literally act like these parents are all deluding themselves. Uh, but that's the way they think, that's their mindset. So he's gonna be doing this. Um, I think the vaccine issue, I don't believe in, in, in forcing this on anybody. Uh, I think it should be available, but I don't think it should be forced. But honestly, the OSHA rule is really much more than about vaccine. Uh, it's about, you know, are we a government of laws or are we a government of individual men who can use the machinery of the federal government to impose their will on the rest of society without any sanction from the Congress, without any legislation being passed. Just go back, find an obscure regulation, and then shoehorn a massive expansion of government into that. Um, and so I think that we, we have a constitution that's worth fighting for. I think it's been battered over the years. Uh, I think that there's been a, a, a lot of problems. I think sometimes our courts haven't done as good a job as they need to do uh, upholding uh, the constitution. And quite frankly, elect officials haven't done as good a job as they should have done upholding it. But now's the time to really speak. And so I urge all of you to do that. And the final thing I will say is I look at what's going on in D.C. And I, full disclosure, uh, am a recovering congressman. I was there for six years in uh, Washington. I'll sometimes see some of my old colleagues at different 
different political functions, and they'll say, oh, man, we miss you so much up here. And I'm like, I don't miss you guys at all. I'm like, I'd much rather be in Florida than be in D.C. And, um, and so, so I look and I think about, okay, our, our, our country, when I ran for Congress in 2012, we had 11, billion, 11 trillion in debt. Now we're at $30 trillion. That's more, that's twice as much debt just in the last 10 years than we did over the entire history of our country. You look at what they do, how they legislate, they literally, if you're a regular member of Congress, you don't even get to read the legislation until like five hours before. So they'll put 2,000 pages there and you gotta figure out, it's all done by an elite cadre uh, of people in the leadership. And, and, that's just, and you see people that have been there forever, like Pelosi and all this stuff. And, and the question is, is you know, it, nothing's really changing. And even when Republicans took over, we still would do. They criticized Pelosi in 2010 for all her shenanigans, and rightfully so. And then we, we get elected, I'm there. They were doing the same stuff, you know, as Republicans. And so I look to say, what can states do to kind of give people a voice in this. And one of the things that Florida has done is we've certified a, a constitutional amendment for term limits for members of Congress. And I think that that's something that is very, very important because at the end of the day, what we have in, in the, at the state level, which I supported at the state level too, is we have people come in, you know, Simpson knows he's gonna have two years, our Speaker of the House has two years, and then it rotates in. So all the incentives are to get things done and to leave a legacy, uh, not just to hold power for power's sake. And so the result is uh, we're able to, to get a lot done. I think people are more in touch with, with their voters as a result. And so in Washington, you know, if you had term limits in Congress, all these people that cause all the problems, they would not even be there anymore. And I can tell you, people will say, well, then the lobbyists run the show or this. That's already happening. The bureaucracy's already running the show. Congress has not disciplined the bureaucracy or done anything. And so you have the ability for states to certify this. I know a few states have done it. I think Alabama's done it, Florida, a couple others. But man, uh, how great would that be if the states were coming and providing a, a restraint. That's how the founders envisioned. They understood when you do these things, you could do it through Congress or you could do it through the state. You could do it through either one. And they knew if you were gonna do things to discipline the people who were in power at the time, you probably had to go around them. They weren't gonna necessarily agree uh, to be able to do it. So I think that that would provide people with an ability, instead of the incentive being you get elected to Congress and your sole goal is to just stay there as long as possible, you get elected to Congress and you'd have a limited time to actually make a difference for people and to actually get things done. Um, and if just think if you got any steam behind this, the amount of fear that that would strike into these people up there. They would be really, really scared because ultimately a lot of the people in D.C. when they're doing what they do, they really do fear the voters. They fear having sunlight uh, on what they're doing um, and they want to continue uh, to basically have the swamp operate as the swamp. So the states that have done it, thank you. The states that, that are considered doing it, I would strongly uh, uh, urge you to consider it and offer my full endorsement uh, on providing uh, an ability for, for we the people in our states with a federal government that's totally out of whack uh, to, to try to make it. You know, this guy in New Jersey that won, he was a truck driver and he beat this, this big, le the, the, this entrenched leader. I mean, honestly, like, th that's awesome and I was really cool to, it was cool to see. But I mean, how rare is that? And I think had, had that entrenched leader taken the race seriously, he probably would have been able to win. He was kind of asleep at the switch. And so the question is, is, you know, getting rid of those entrenched people, that should happen all the time. And it's very, very rare, particularly rare when we're talking about Congress. So that would be a way. And you may be able to get this through Congress, but I think the states would probably have to lead too. You're never going to have fiscal sanity in D.C unless you have some type of balanced budget amendment uh, to the Constitution. We have to balance our budget in the state of Florida. I'm sure most of you have to balance your budgets in your individual states. If you were given the option to just simply charge it on the credit card and leave the problems for others, you would have strong political incentive to do it. Why make tough choices if you don't have to do it? I mean, that's just a natural human response. And so that's what we've seen happening in Washington. And I think if they were forced uh, to actually make decisions, then some of the train that we're seeing would potentially be slowed down. I also just scratch my head. 
We have inflation. We have all these issues. And so what are they proposing to do? Basically write, which they say 1.75 trillion, but actually they said now, Wharton said it's closer to $5 trillion. They're going to write hot checks for $5 trillion in the midst of an inflation spiral? Uh, somebody's got to check this. But I can tell you, we are going to have an opportunity uh, to provide a really strong check in November of 2022. And that will give us opportunities to do a lot. It will give us opportunity. And the way politics works is you, know, you do a good job, you, know, you get rewarded. And I think that that's true. I think if people think you're doing a good job, you do. But the times that people get really animated are when they're upset about what's going on. And so I think people look to see what's going on up there and I think they're really, really frustrated because things have gone really, really south very, very quickly. So our voters, they are going to vote. They are ready to vote. I mean, if we could do the midterm now, I mean, we would win the Congress and the Senate and a bunch of this, all this stuff. But this is an opportunity, I think, similar to 2010 when we won all those uh, House seats and all the state legislative seats. I mean, that's really helped change the dynamics in the state having that kind of wave election. I think this is going to be a wave election, and I think that you guys have an opportunity to expand your majorities, or if you're in the minority, maybe get expand that and maybe get close to a majority. We should be able to flip some chambers uh, throughout the, the United States. We have a great opportunity to pick up governorships, uh, particularly in like the Midwest and some of those other areas. Of course, we need to reelect governors that we have, like Governor of Florida, and so uh, we'll be working on that. So it gives us opportunities, I think, to, to really, really do. So if you have a good agenda and you tell people what you're going to do, they give you the ability and you go in and do it, you know, that's, that's really what it's all about. If you go back and look at my inauguration speech in January of 2019, you know, I listed things. I've, I've already accomplished everything I promised I'd do. I did everything I'd say. I said it, and I did it. And, you know, and some of these things are, are kind of like, you know, we're doing stuff with Everglades. I mean, that's still in progress, but I've already delivered on what I said I would do on all of that. And that's the thing. When you're, when you're in politics, if you say you're going to do it and you do it, the people that voted for you for, for that, they, they really appreciate it. But even the people that may not agree with it, they respect the fact that you're not just blowing hot air that you're actually willing to put your money where your mouth is, and that if you made commitments, you work and you follow through on those commitments. And so I would say make sure you guys have good agendas. If you're in a, one of these blue states, you've never had more ammunition to go after these folks than now. You know, hold their feet to the fire and how they've treated law enforcement, how they've locked people down, how they're in the pocket of the teachers' unions and would completely be willing to keep schools closed indefinitely if they could get away with it, if that's what the unions wanted. Make sure uh, that, they're, that they're made to answer for all that. Make sure that they're made to answer for supporting Biden, who I think is going to be the least popular president in a midterm uh, since probably the advent of polling. Uh, so let's make sure that they have to say, I mean, are you going to stand by this or not? Or are you going to actually distance? So we have all these opportunities, and the final thing I'll just say is it, it, it's, it's happening in spite of all the powers that be trying to prop this administration up. You know, you look at, like, the corporate press. The, p people are joking about this brand and stuff. You know, it's like, um, and people love it. And what, what's happened is, and, and the media, they hate it because they're just like, you know, any anytime people are, are, especially when it's, I mean, it's not just like in like the most conservative places. You're seeing this chance in like the streets of New York City and all kinds of places where you wouldn't necessarily do. But the, the, the media really, really hates it. And but what the media doesn't understand, the reason why people like it and the reason why it's funny is because it really is critiquing the media, too. Because, you know, this all came about. There was a race in NASCAR. NBC reporter is interviewing uh, the, this guy, the race car. His name was Brandon. And the crowd, they're chanting very colorful chants about Joe Biden. Okay? <laughs> and look, I mean, you know, uh, look, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're, we're G-rated around, around here in the governor's office. But it is what it is, right? Well, you could hear it on TV. The reporter knew what they were saying. And so instead of either ignoring it or acknowledging it, she lied about it. She said they were chanting, let's go, Brandon. And so what it is is I think it's a critique to, yes, people are showing dissatisfaction 
uh, about the Biden regime, but they're also acknowledging, you know, the media's attempt to gaslight the public, you know, which they've been doing for years and years. And you're looking at this Russia collusion stuff. They're finally indicting these people. You know, they did that for two years, round the clock, and it was all a lie. And they knew it was a lie. They knew there was no evidence there. They always use these anonymous sources, which they, they make up anonymous sources, but they don't have sources most of the time. They're printing gossip, and they're using anonymous sources to do it, and that's what they did. So you're seeing those, um, and you do, and, and they really get upset about it because they think they should be able to control the narrative. They think they should be able to elevate the people they want. And if you're not in that club, they can smear you, and the public, you know, won't like you. But what's happening is, you know, people believe that what they see with their own eyes. They believe the truth, and they're not going to be gaslit anymore. So, so that is something with all of what we have with with the media pushing up, big tech censoring his opposition. Unfortunately, corporate America becoming very woke in line with, with the Biden regime. With all of that, uh, you still have somebody who the average American not only thinks is not doing a good job, but thinks is not up to the job. And so we have an opportunity uh, to really show a better way, but we're going to face resistance from all of those different institutions in every race in the country. I mean, they're, I get... I'm the number one target for the corporate press in the country. And, but, you know, when you stand up and fight back against them, people like you more for doing that. And so really what we have to do, yes, we've got to stand for, for solid policies and, and, and conservative principles and all the things that differentiate us from a really radical left wing and a Biden administration that's out of control. Uh, but that's not enough. I think when you have all these different forces arrayed and when uh, you're constantly, anytime you take a stand, you're going to get all kinds of blowback, you've got to have courage at this time. You've got to be able to stand up there. You've got to be able to take fire. Uh, you've got to be able to fight back. You cannot let them bully you. You can't let them uh, cause you to back down. You've got to walk the line. You've got to stand your ground. So that's what we do in the state of Florida. Uh, we hold, hold the line here. Uh, we stand our ground. We're on offense on issue after issue. Uh, we do not let them slow us down. And, man, we've accomplished an awful lot here in the state of Florida. Uh, but I can tell you this, uh, I've only begun to fight. So thank you, guys. We appreciate it.